Thank you so much. It is uh, such an honor to be with you. And I'm really moved uh, not only uh, by the honor, but by this entire morning uh, and to be in the company of so many distinguished alumni uh, and to be uh, gathered here to get a chance to join you in this appreciation of uh, President uh, Furman and her remarkable legacy uh, over these many years. Uh, and please join me again in honoring and thanking President Furman. <clears throat> I also want to thank Phyllis Kossoff and the Kossoff family um, for bringing me here today and, uh, and for your example uh, of showing up as a citizen, uh, not only of this institution, but uh, of the city and beyond, and your family's history of uh, converting hardship into help for others uh, is an example that I think all of us can carry, and uh, I really am moved to be connected uh, to you and your family. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm just uh, also so grateful to be here with the entire Teachers College uh, community this morning. And, uh, you know, receiving this medal and getting a chance to deliver this Kossoff medal, um, my sense of gratitude arises not only from the honor uh, that's been bestowed here, but also from the realization that I am now part of a lineage. I am now part of a lineage that is part of a lineage that is part of a lineage. This 10th academic festival and this Kossoff lecture are part of the greater history of Teachers College, which we've been hearing about, which is, of course, part of the greater history of Columbia University, which is a part of the greater history of the state of New York, which is a part of the greater history of the United States. And in each instance, the one thing is not just a part of the greater thing. It is rather a catalyst that changes and enriches and helps realize the promise of the greater thing. Now, I've got lineages on the mind because earlier this week I was in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the American Academy for Arts and Sciences uh, where I'm co-chairing a new commission on the practice of democratic citizenship. And I learned something there that moved me. When the Academy was founded in 1780, the Revolutionary War had not yet even been won. But John Adams and the other founders of the Academy were already looking ahead to the future, planning an institution like the Academy and looking to that future when a fragile republic would need new sources of new and useful ideas. Consider the audacity of that. It's the same audacity that led President Lincoln to sign the Morrill Act, creating land-grant colleges across the land, even as the bloodiest battles of the Civil War were yet to be fought. It's the same audacity that led the founders of this institution to imagine during the Gilded Age, the, the last Gilded Age, that a teacher's college, steeped in practical methods and rooted in the life of the city, could help educate the poor and thus redeem the American promise. Well, I'm inspired by all that audacity. And that is why I claim here that we who are gathered together today, we will be remembered as part of a great civic awakening in the United States and beyond, a revival of the culture and the practice of democratic citizenship. Now, you could be forgiven for being less hopeful than I am. The same John Adams who created the American Academy also warned a quarter century later in 1814 that, quote, there was never a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. Now, our democracy here in the United States today is not quite suicidal, but it is definitely in a state of self-inflicted fragility that would have disturbed and disquieted the founding generation. And this crisis, this sickness in the American body politic did not come upon us immediately, recently, in the last, say, 17 months. It is the result, actually, of 40 years of rising inequality, 40 years of relentless concentration of wealth, 40 years of erosion of common purpose under leaders of both parties, and 40 years of the devaluation of public education in general and of civic education in particular. Today, at this homecoming, at one of the nation's great education institutions, I challenge you to remember why you come home. Not just to see old friends, but also to recommit to original purposes. And the purpose of this place is simple, to make every school a school of democracy, and to make every teacher a teacher of citizenship.
As uh, the former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor has often said, compulsory public education was instituted in this country in the first place to create citizens, not wage workers, not customers, not capitalists, but citizens capable of governing themselves and their country. Now, when I speak here of citizenship, I want to be clear what I mean. I'm not talking about documentation status under the immigration and naturalization laws of the United States. I'm talking right now about a bigger ethical notion, a more capacious notion of how to be a contributor to community, a member of the body. As we know, there are many people in this country who lack the documents but live like big citizens. And there are plenty of people in this country And frankly, there are plenty more who have the documents, but don't. So to define citizenship, I often use a very simple equation. P plus CH equals CI. Power plus character equals citizenship. And I want to unpack each element of this equation. Power. Power is the capacity to ensure that others do as you would like them to do. I'm sorry to be so blunt and impolite in that definition, although actually I'm not that sorry, because I think this is what is called upon us right now, is to be blunt and direct about what is and what is not. And also not sorry, I think, are the teachers right now who walked out in West Virginia recently, or the teachers who today are striking in Oklahoma and Kentucky. They're not sorry. They're not sorry at all. They're rather pleased, actually, to be rediscovering that they have more power than they thought they had. They're tickled to be learning that while power always compounds and power always justifies itself, it is also always possible to break out of a rigged status quo by remembering that power is, in fact, infinite. That it is possible at every turn to generate brand new power out of thin air through the magic act of organizing. Now take note, I'm not using words that sometimes people use to make power feel a little safer and a little less upsetting. Words like voice and influence and agency. I'm talking about power without euphemism. And I want you to as well. Power is a literacy as much as reading and writing. And what does power literacy mean? It means understanding the sources of power in civic life, money, people, ideas, social norms, state action, force. It means being able to read and to write power, and to read and be, write a map of power. Who has it? Who doesn't? Why that is? How that came to be? Where that power is concentrated and where it is hidden? And where it is flaunted? It means being able to ask why that map looks that way. And then it means being able to rewrite that map which is to say to rearrange the landscape of institutions and narratives and other conduits of power that shape life in this city, this country, and this planet. This is what we try to teach at Citizen University. But it's not a college in a baccalaureate degree granting sort of way, but is a people's platform for learning power. Now, power illiteracy is corrosive to freedom and conducive to authoritarianism and it afflicts tens of millions of Americans today. That is why, if you are not teaching power and you call yourself an educator, you are committing professional malpractice right now. If you aren't teaching power, you are sending young people into the world unready to face the world, much less change it. Now, in a very different institution from this one, in the Marine Corps, I learned recently there's an ethic in the Marine Corps that's captured in the motto, every Marine a rifleman which means whatever your job is in the fleet, cook, recruiter, pilot, supply officer, you are expected to have good marksmanship and to know the basics of infantry tactics. Why? Because the point of the Marine Corps is infantry combat. So when I say every teacher a civics teacher, I mean something akin to that, actually. Whether you teach middle school math or elementary school music, or English as a second language, you should be expected to teach civics. In an American school, there should be no such thing, actually, as not teaching civics, because the point of schooling is citizenship. Now consider the teenager 
who finds out that in that math class, that mastering math and mastering algebra puts her in the room where decisions will be made later about spending and budgets and money. Or the sixth grader who realizes that his knack for telling stories through song lands him at the front of a massive protest rally. Or the students from Syria or East Africa who gain enough English to tell the principal and their teachers just how they are being welcomed or not in this school and society. All of them, if taught properly, can learn a curriculum of power along with the curriculum of math or music or ESL, which will make them all more able, more of the time, for more of their lives, to participate more fully in civic life. And then, of course, for people whose job it is, in fact, to teach civics, well, your responsibility is to teach it, of course, not by the book, but by doing, to do it in classic teacher's college fashion. The emerging field of action civics, embodied by organizations now like the Mikva Challenge, which started in Chicago and now is in LA and DC, and Generation Citizen, which started in New England and now works all around the United States. This field of action civics is giving young people the chance to practice power, to change Sydney, city ordinances in Chicago, to do participatory budgeting in LA, to change the narrative about homelessness in DC. Think about the students from Parkland who led us and this country in one of the greatest mass protests in history. Those students from Parkland who organized the March for Our Lives, they may have been unusually eloquent and self-possessed and capable, but it was not an accident that they were so prepared to act after the gun massacre at their school. They were, in fact, the products of years of bipartisan investment in the state of Florida in robust, practical civic education. When tragedy and fate called, they were ready. They were ready to organize. They were ready to mobilize. They were ready to advocate, and they were ready to act. And they are proving themselves today far more fluent in power than many of the adults around them in and out of the classroom. But while literacy and power is necessary, it is never sufficient. If all you have is mastery of the tactics of getting other people to do what you want, and that mastery is untethered from any ethical sense or moral core, then you are just a highly skilled sociopath. <clears throat> I'm sure if you stretch, you can think of a person or two that fits that definition. Remember, P plus CH equals CI. And so I now want to speak a bit about the second half of that equation, character. Now, I know that some people recoil at the word character in the same way that some people are allergic to the word power. And I admit that talk of character often comes from loud mouth moralizing hypocrites. But that fact, and it is a fact, that fact does not absolve us as citizens or teachers from the cultivation and the practice of character. In fact, it compounds our responsibility. And when I say character, I speak not primarily, in fact, in this instance, not particularly at all about individual personal virtues like diligence or perseverance or grit, important as those are. I'm talking about character in the collective, how to be, how to live, how to move constructively among other humans in a community. I mean ethics like reciprocity and mutuality. I mean compassion, justice, shared responsibility and shared sacrifice. I mean contribution before consumption. I mean a recognition that in a network society, there really is no such thing as someone else's problem. That society becomes how you behave. I mean a disposition not to hoard advantage and privilege, but to circulate it. And to do so not as some kind of selfless, altruistic act of sacrifice, but rather as a savvy, out of a savvy realization that we're all better off when we're all better off. True self-interest is mutual interest. And this kind of civic character, like civic power, can be taught. In fact, must be taught. At Citizen University, we work with educators and young people all over the United States to, do, to design experiences 
that teach civic character. Sometimes we use precept. A slogan like, we're all better off when we're all better off, is a pretty handy teaching tool, especially when you set it against some alternatives like every man for himself or let the market sort things out. Sometimes we use ritual. We run gatherings across the country that we heard a little bit about called Civic Saturdays, which are a civic analog to church or synagogue or mosque. But instead of being about church or synagogue or mosque religion, they are about American civic religion, about the creed of liberty and equal justice and how we actually live up to that creed or fail to in our daily acts and choices. Sometimes in our work, we partner with great organizations like Facing History and Ourselves, which uses case studies from the Holocaust and the Japanese American internment and the civil rights movement and apartheid era South Africa to teach young people the elements and the art of moral choice making and empathy. Now every day's news, every day's news offers us a new lesson plan in civic character and how character relates to power. What is the meaning of the Me Too movement? What's the moral core of Black Lives Matter? What's the significance ethically of the way Facebook has abused our trust? It's not as simple as Lord Acton's dictum that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Frankly, I think that's too deterministic. It removes free will and moral responsibility from the picture. In my view, power does not so much corrupt as it reveals character. Abraham Lincoln, at the height of his bloody powers, embodied forgiveness and humanity. It is possible to practice power with character, and it is necessary to highlight those who do. Now, let me tell you why, despite our times, despite the sickness and frailty of the body politic right now, I am so hopeful. In part, in part, to be honest, it is because of the man who currently occupies the White House. After all, he alone, as he likes to say, he alone has sparked the greatest surge of civic engagement this country has seen in half a century. <laughs> Millions of Americans, progressives, yes, but also libertarians and principled conservatives and independents are stepping off the sidelines and participating. Record numbers of women and scientists and young people are choosing to run for office. Record numbers of people are showing up at congressional town meetings and learning about their legislative town meetings and registering to vote. There are unremitting waves now of marches and protests. Civic entrepreneurs sprouting up to start new ventures that teach organizing and advocacy. People swarming in New York and all around the United States, swarming like antibodies to a virus, to airports, to defend refugees and the rule of law. The immune system of the body politic is kicking in. But the goal now for us cannot be simply to restore the status quo ante. Going from acute illness merely to chronic illness isn't going to cut it. The goal now for us has to be civic renewal, revival, and awakening. And that requires what we call in education a community of practice. It requires a web of relationship an obligation that keeps you from checking out or burning out. Now, most Americans, unfortunately, lack such a network of mutual aid and moral purpose. But you, you who are a part of the teacher's college community and family, you are blessed. You are fabulously wealthy. You are fabulously wealthy and awash in civic and social and moral capital. You are why I'm hopeful. And you have models for how not to squander that wealth and how not to blow that inheritance. John Dewey, of course, on this very campus, cultivated a philosophy of learning and teaching that was rooted in doing, this deeply American what works approach to making citizens out of students. A few generations later, as we've heard and as you've already honored, Shirley Chisholm took what she learned here at Teachers College to become an elementary teacher, which exposed her to local politics, which led her to run for office, which eventually led her to be the first black woman to run for the presidency of the United States.
One of my favorite stories uh, about Shirley Chisholm is that when she first got to the United States Congress representing Bed-Stuy, the men who controlled the committee assignments in the House of Representatives tried to belittle her, kind of mock her, by assigning her to the Agriculture Committee. She bristled at first, and then she realized, actually, she could use that seat to get surplus food from farmers for free school lunches and family nutrition programs for the poor. She partnered with Kansas Republican Senator Bob Dole, and she showed folks that a teacher's college alumna knows how to bypass a rigged system and make things work for the people. <clears throat> and then two generations after Chisholm, a former student of mine named Sam Lim came here to Teachers College. Yeah, some of you know Sam. Sam, who grew up in a Singaporean, Chinese, immigrant working family, has always hustled, and he's always hustled for others. He had to scrape and scrap for scholarships. And so he founded, when he got to college, something called Scholarship Junkies to make it easier for other kids to fund and finance their education. At the University of Washington, he took a class that I taught called How to Read, Write, and Speak, Basics of Civic Argumentation. And he used that knowledge to work at something called the Dream Project at UW which coaches poor kids how to make their college applications great and powerful. And now he's the director of graduate and fellowship programs at the Posse Foundation. Like John Dewey, who joined the faculty here in 1904, like Shirley Chisholm from your class of 1952, my young friend Sam Lim, class of 2014, embodies in flesh and blood the elements of my core equation, P plus CH equals CI. Like them, Sam became a big citizen by working to make big citizens. Well, I open this lecture by speaking of lineages, and I'd like to close it that way as well. The line from Dewey to Chisholm to Lim to all of you is direct. It is thick, unbreakable, and vital. It is a cord of mystic and moral connection that reminds us that democracy like teaching, is an act of faith. It is an agreement simply to believe. Believing that self-government is possible helps make it possible. Our choices and deeds then complete the matter. And this notion of a creed that must be made good by deeds, this notion is profoundly American. It is profoundly New York. It is profoundly Columbia. It is profoundly Teachers College. And it is profoundly all of you. You are the products of this great lineage. Now go pass it on. Thank you very much. Thank you.